Welcome to Leaders of the West, a podcast for innovators and change makers. I'm your host, Jesse Jarvis, the founder of Of the West, and I'm sitting down with agriculturalists, entrepreneurs, executives, and everyone in between with the goal of digging into the strategies, mindsets, and lessons that have been crucial to the success of ag and Western. Whether you're carrying on the next generation of your family's operation, starting something from scratch, or determined to climb up the leadership ladder, we're going to inspire you to continue to dream big, growing not just you, but the future of agriculture and Western as a whole. Let's go. I know we have a number of you listeners who are solo entrepreneurs or you own your own creative or professional business. You don't want a full-time or a part-time job, but you're always on the hunt for new clients and customers. And that's easier said than done which is why we created the directory. It's a place where entrepreneurs and businesses just like you can be found by those who are looking for your skills and services. Whether you are a photographer, a graphic designer, a business consultant, a marketing agency, a virtual assistant, an event speaker, an event planner, a lawyer, a bookkeeper, an accountant, you can see where I'm going with this, right? As long as you have a business that's based in the ag and Western industries, then you're a fit to be listed on the directory. There's a section where you can tell who you are and what you do. You can share your work portfolio or customer testimonials. You can add the specific platforms and programs that you're a wizard in. Those profiles that we have are really, really robust because we want people to be able to easily search and find what they're looking for, which is YOU. All in all, the directory is a great way to get in front of your ideal customer or client and a new audience that you maybe wouldn't have reached before because they're outside of your inner circle of who can mention your name in those word of mouth recommendations. If you're ready to create your profile on the directory, you can go to ofthewest.co to get started. That is ofthewest.co. You guys will love it. Trust me. Welcome to this week's episode of Leaders of the West. Today, we are sitting down with Tom Brink, who is an absolute legend in the cattle industry. He's the current CEO of the Red Angus Association, and he's also the founder and owner of Top Dollar Angus. As I mentioned, he's incredibly well-known throughout the beef industry. He is an expert on production, supply chain, anything there is to know about the cattle industry. Tom Brink is the man. And I credit Justin for being the one who encouraged me to ask Tom to sit down for this interview. We were talking about the podcast and guests one night, and he was like, you know what, Jesse, you really need to invite Tom to be on the show. I think it would be a great interview. And man, was Justin right. The amount of knowledge that Tom shares with us, not just about the cattle industry, but about hiring, about how Red Angus Association is adopting remote work and a hybrid schedule, about what it takes to be a good leader. There is a little bit of everything in this show, and it's definitely going to go down as one of my favorites. So without further ado, here he is, Tom Brink. Tom, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. I'm really excited to share more about you and the Red Angus Association of America. But to kick things off, let's start by telling us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and what has led to where you are now. Well, Jesse, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and have a chance to just have a good conversation about the beef industry and Red Angus and maybe Top Dollar Angus and a lot of things that are going on in the industry. My background, I guess, is I'm I'm an old gray-haired guy that's been in the business a long time. And Grew up in Kansas with the cow-calf background there, went to Kansas State, got several degrees there. And then uh, way back in the late 1980s, I started working for Cattle Facts. That's kind of where I started my career. So that was a great experience for a number of years and ended up in the later on in the cattle feeding business. I worked for a company that a lot of people will remember named Conti Beef. That was Continental Grains Cattle Feeding Division which became Five Rivers. We merged with the Montfort Yards in 2005. So I did that for quite a number of years and then uh, been in the Breed Association thing actually twice in my career. Spent three years at the Gelvie Association back in the late 1990s and then been with Red Angus now since 2016, so a little over eight years. So I, I feel very fortunate and blessed to have been able to see the entire spectrum of the industry of really had a chance to work pretty much in all segments of the industry and it's been tremendous it's i've seen a lot of change and but i've never seen things changing as fast as they are now which makes the industry i think very interesting and exciting challenging too though so it's been you know i guess i'm 35 six years into my career so to speak and i still have a lot of energy for this business so i'm i'm excited to 
continue and see how things change in the future. A lot of good things happening. Oh boy, what a time to be alive in the cattle industry. But I want to highlight the diversity in your background because until you had given me that story, I didn't necessarily know that you really have been involved in all sectors of the industry. And I can imagine that's part of what has allowed you to be so well-rounded. And when you think about issues, you don't just think about them as how does this impact the cow-calf guy or how does this impact the purebred guy or how does this impact you know, the feeder, you're able to think of that in an approach of how does this impact everybody in all sectors of the supply chain? You know, it's been great working with people in all different segments of the supply chain. And you do learn a lot working with those people that started for me at Cattle Facts and even the agribusiness sector too, because we worked with a lot of egg bankers and we worked with nutritionists. I mean, you can just name it and We had those people coming into the office when I was young in my career. I really got to see a lot of different things. And then actually, as as time went on, working in different segments, being up close and personal to a big packer, which I was for a while at Five Rivers, and you kind of see how they think and how they do business. And so it does help. We are a segmented industry, but we're trying to figure out how to do a better job, I think, working together. And so I guess my experience does help that to some degree because I've been on all sides of it, from the seed stock end all the way through. And I've owned cows always, too. I mean, seed stock and commercial cows. And so I kind of do feel like I understand, at least generally speaking, all segments of the business and how they fit together. Well, and I think that's really important because so often we think about, well, well, how does this issue or how does, you know, whatever it is that we're considering at the time, how does it impact our operation? Which is an important question to consider because we have a business. And so that's, we want to make decisions that are best for our business. But What's best for our specific business isn't necessarily best for the industry as a whole. And so I think it is really important to kind of have your head on that swivel and think about, okay, what are the long-term effects? How does this impact the industry and maybe not just me? Well, that's all very true, Jesse. And there's one more thing I would add to that. And that would be the fact that the opportunities in the future may involve you doing things and thinking outside of the ranch gate and beyond the ranch gate, so to speak, and creating opportunity that will come back to you and will help your own operation. If you're a rancher, that's kind of, I guess, my, was my assumption or anybody that is a rancher, that I think we're at a time when we've got to look at opportunities that are somewhat non-traditional. And we, we think that, you know, we have to start thinking about the fact that somebody's going to buy my calves and somebody's going to feed my calves and maybe they're going to go into a program And if I get connected to the right network, so to speak, in that regard, then there's probably more profit opportunity for me. And I've been around long enough to remember when we debated whether there was such a thing as value added. We didn't really even know when we talked about it, but a lot of people were skeptical. Can I really get paid for value added work and different programs that I might enroll in and some of them cost money and so forth? That debate has ended, and I think people realize there truly is premium opportunity or additional revenue opportunity for, you know, not every program that's out there, but for many of them. And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing because people really can start to think outside the box a little bit. We always, when we talk to ranchers, we say, you know, we try to get to know their operation and what they're good at, what their genetics are. You know, are they a good fit for a natural program? Some are, some are not at all. And so those are the kind of conversations I think that every serious cow-calf producer should first probably have with themselves and say, what is my value-added opportunity? And then go out and consult with people involved in different aspects of what's going on in in value-added marketing because it's real. It's real. And that's a new, that's, I guess it's not new. It is somewhat new, but it's really starting to come to fruition, I think. And again, we, we've got to go into that with both eyes open and really evaluate where we can fit our cattle as an individual rancher into what's offered out there in terms of value-added programs. But there are some real benefits today. And I see, I see a lot of people, and they're probably the most progressive people I know in many cases, that are making some significant additional profit because of what they're doing on the value-added side. And so we couldn't have said that, Jesse. We couldn't have probably said that 10, 15 years ago as much. No. And honestly, it talks about the importance of being progressive. And whether you are on a ranch or you're in a business or you, you know, on the ag business side of things, it pays to be progressive and to continue to 
work on new opportunities and find new relationships and try to better things, I think that there's a lot of power in that. But let's talk about Top Dollar Angus, a program that is known across the Angus breeds. But you were the one who created that. So to make sure that everybody's on the same page, can you explain what exactly Top Dollar Angus is? Top Dollar Angus is a, we call it a genetic verification and marketing assistance company. So those are kind of the two big buckets of what Top Dollar Angus does. And it has been, and we've been around since 2014, so 10 years this year, in fact. And what really, I guess, I saw in the the whole genesis of the idea for Top Dollar Angus started for me with my time and work at Five Rivers in that we saw huge differences. We had a lot of data. We fed a lot of cattle. We gridded a lot of cattle. So we saw the financial results and the performance results on just literally millions of cattle over time. And we had a good database where we could analyze a lot of that. And so I started realizing that we were having trouble predicting cattle. And one of the big things that we didn't have at that time was genetics. We did not understand or have any data on the genetic differences between different groups of cattle that we would buy. We probably intuitively knew it was affecting performance, but we couldn't measure it. We couldn't tell one group from the next. If they all weighed 800 pounds, you know, you'd see about 10 groups that weighed eight. Then you're going to see a very substantial difference in performance. Some of that is non-genetic, but genetics do affect about 30 to 35, maybe even 40 percent of performance outcomes and financial outcomes in the feedlot. And so I realized that was a missing link. I just realized that that was something that the industry didn't have. We had, you might say, we had at low information feeder cattle. We, we kind of still have that to some degree, although we're doing a lot better 10 years hence than we were at that time. And so that was the idea behind Top Dollar Angus is let's verify the genetics. And we chose to focus on the top 25% growth and carcass traits and the cattle also it's it is top dollar angus they have to be 50 percent or more angus or red angus and so that was our niche so to speak that we focused on and it's proven it's proven out very well because when you and of course the industry is getting better at genetics than they used to be we've made progress in the last 10 years but good genetics in our opinion do need an identity and to stand out in what I call a very noisy marketplace. I mean, there is a lot of noise and some smoke and mirrors, you might say, in our marketplace. And so good genetics need to be verified by a third party so they can be believable and labeled. And that's what the Top Dollar Angus logo stands for. And of course, we've got data to validate the performance differences and, and so forth. So that's it's still an evolving situation in our industry. But I think people, what I see anyway, is people are waking up to the power of genetics. All cattle have genetics. We don't sit here and think about that very often, but some of those genetics are not very good. Some, a lot of them are in the average zone, and then some of them are really exceptional. And so it is, I think, in the future, something we're going to continue to see more of, and that is uh, measuring genetics, commercial producers getting an idea around what their genetics are. And then certainly on the the high end, putting a label like the top dollar Angus label on them. I think especially for those, because on the purebred or seed stock side of things, obviously genetics, that's what those businesses are founded on. But I think especially on the commercial sector of things, we are only in the beginning on the change that we are going to see in genetics and and how that really bases the decisions that we make in our day-to-day now for the future for sure. So true, Jesse. I mean, if you think about it, we we talk about genetic merit and using genetic merit in price discovery of commercial feeder cattle. That's something that is a very new concept for a vast majority of our industry. And yet, if we look at our seed stock segment, we have used genetic merit through EPDs and indexes for a long time. I mean, since you were probably before you were born. And it took us a while, you know, to get to that point. But we have data in the red Angus breed. We can show you very quantitatively that the better genetic bulls on average will sell better. And because commercial producers are seeking those better genetics, certainly phenotype still matters and structure and feet and everything else. But we can we can give you data that shows that better genetics, those bulls do sell for more money than, than those that are below average. And I, th- I think that's a very good thing. It says 
number one, that those commercial producers are becoming more discriminating. They're seeking better genetics. And it also creates incentive for seed stock breeders to make better genetics. And so both of those things are good for those individuals and for the industry as a whole. Oh, absolutely. It just continues to make us more efficient and and more sustainable. And obviously, we know as an industry, we are already, but why not continue to better what we're already doing? So we know why you started Top Dollar Angus, but you have this idea, then what? Like, what were your next steps in, okay, how do I actually get this off the ground? Like any entrepreneurial business, you you look back and you say, the core idea is probably fine, but the implementation, we learned a lot over the last, you know, five plus 10 years. And I think we have learned a lot and we're, we're doing things pretty much like we set out to do. However, I would say that it's been slower and than I thought it would be. And that's just probably because of the industry more than anything being slower to adopt just a new thought process. But the fun part of that, and this has been the very enjoyable part, is I feel like we've gotten to work with some of the very best cutting edge producers that exist. And that's both on the seed stock side with our seed stock partnership program and also with with the commercial producers that have joined. And there were some that just told us early on, I've been waiting for this. You know, I've been waiting because I knew I had good genetics. I just needed somebody to help me get them quantified and identified and put a label on them the marketplace would recognize. So that's been, that part of it has been very fun. I think we, I think we underestimated, I mean, just thinking back, I think we underestimated, we, this was a fairly simple concept in our mind, but I spent a lot of time thinking about it too, and not everybody has. And so our discovery was that we had to really find simple ways to communicate what we were, even though, again, we felt like our business was a fairly simple concept. And uh, so that was, I don't know if that was a surprise, Jesse, but it did take some additional work and we had to kind of back up, you might say, and and go back to the basics a lot, but it's changed. I mean, a lot of things have changed and the conversations today are easier than they were, you know, 10 years ago, just because like you said, more people are thinking about genetics and the bull market has evolved and that's a good parallel. So uh, there's been a lot of learnings along the way. No surprise, right? No. You know, I love that you said that you really had to take a step back because it's so simple to you, but then explaining it to other people, they find it to be confusing. And that's not, that's not top dollar Angus. That is everything in life. We, the people who, who have these ideas or who are in it, we think, oh, this is so easy. This makes so much sense. But everything has to be, and I don't want to make any, I'm not saying that anybody's dumb by any means, but you really do have to dumb the message down and make it like the 99 level, 101 level understandable because there's so much that everybody has going on in their daily life. We think that, you know, they're going to read a textbook about what it is that we're trying to get them to do or sell them the product we've experienced this with of the West too. And you really do have to make it simple. Simple is the win. So I guess if anybody's listening out there and you're having trouble with your marketing message, I would advise you, keep it simple, make it simple, walk it back. That's what people tend to understand the most. And repeat it often, right? Repeat it often because people won't tend to necessarily wrap their minds around it the first time. And it's not because they're not smart people. No, not at all. Because it's outside of their everyday and they haven't really noticed what's going on or they haven't spent time thinking about it. And so it does take a warm up period. It really does. And so there was, and and I think we're still in that in this industry related to genetic verification. I think we're in, you said this earlier and you're absolutely right. We're in our infancy on the commercial side. We're quite a ways along on the seed stock side. And that's a good parallel, like we've said, but we are just getting started on the commercial side. And when you think, and I said this already, but genetics influence between 30 and 40% of outcomes in the feedlots and on the and on the grid that's big you can't not know what that piece of the performance pie is and there's big variation we've got studies that show that i mean with in this kind of a market i mean good genetics versus not so good genetics you're talking about 2 or 300 dollars a head in value difference and that's clearly massive and so we, we have the tools. That's the other thing that's new is we now have the genetic tools 
in the form of EPDs, indexes on most bulls and most breeds and all that kind of thing, as well as commercial DNA tests. And we have tools to be able to differentiate cattle that they're not perfect, but they're good and they're useful. And so we didn't, again, 10, 15 years ago, they were starting to emerge, but they have come a long way since then, both in accuracy and really in the number and the availability. The cost is gradually coming down on a lot of that. And so we're in a very good place to start to take advantage of genetics in the commercial sector. And and again, that's why I guess I believe we're just getting started. You said that too, so I guess you agree. Well, you know, the other thing that I will say is I think that as an industry, we're definitely just getting started on the genetic side of things. I think now we feel like we're so far in because we have been thinking about this for a while and we're starting to do things, but no, it, we are just in in the infancy. But I also want to keep in mind or make a point that you guys have been in business for 10 years and you still feel like you are in your infancy because I too, you kind of think like if you build it, they will come. And I've said this time and time again, Kevin Costner lied when he told us that because you can't just build your field of dreams and have people show up. They're not knocking down the door. You really do have to continue to work at it. So when Tom says that we've been in business 10 years and we're just getting started, Anybody out there who is in that beginning stage of business or is thinking about starting a business, it's going to take a lot longer than you anticipate. And I can tell you that by personal experience, too. You know, a very (laughs) smart friend of mine by the name of Brian McCullough, who probably some of your listeners would know, he's now a retired Angus breeder from Wisconsin, told me when I started Top Dollar Angus, he said, get ready, it'll take 15 years to really get established. And I thought, Brian, you got to be kidding me. I don't know if I have that much patience, but he's he's been right. I mean, and I think in the end, he will be proven accurate on that because it does take a lot of time and it's some tenacity and really just staying at it. It is getting easier. There's more the the context, you might say, in which we're doing business is really changing. And so that's going to help us. I think that's going to be good for, you know, anybody involved in genetic ventures, probably of various kinds, but it has been slow in coming. Yeah, it sure has. Gosh. Well, you know, somebody told me if you aren't willing to dedicate 10 years to the thing that you want to do, to that dream, then it's probably not going to work out. And man, four years into Of the West, I can also say the same thing. I have my eye on the 10-year prize and some days it's easier than others. But I think that that mark is definitely one one that you've you've got to be willing to be in it for the long haul. You know, if you're a real, you really do. And you know, if you're a real entrepreneur, if you get strong calluses against the word no. And secondly, you can restart and regain your excitement when you have small successes. And you talk to that next producer who you hadn't talked to before. He gets it or she gets it and they decide to work with you and it just ignites your passion again. I mean, then, you know, to me, you're a real entrepreneur because you, you've got what it takes to stay at it. You can you can ride out the lows and you can just enjoy the small successes and those small highs that you get. And that's what kept us going. I mean, that's really what kept us going is working with those producers that had once they heard what we're doing, once they understood it, they shared the vision and they saw they saw that there was benefit for them. And just everything regarded where the industry was headed. And that was fun. And it still is fun. I mean, it's still fun to do that. So on the topic of producers, if somebody who is listening, they raise Angus or Red Angus cattle, and they're interested in rolling their calves in top dollar Angus, how can they do so? Yeah, you can talk to our general manager, who is a young man named Nate Smith out of Kansas. And you can go to the topdollarangus.com website or even our Facebook page and get his contact information. So Nate is our day-to-day manager. We have another employee as well, but uh, Nate, I guess, and some part-time people, but Nate is the person to talk to about enrollment. We do herd evaluations. We do genetic herd evaluations at no cost. So there is no obligation if you want to talk to Nate and we'll evaluate your herd and kind of help you understand where you are genetically and see if you're a fit for top dollar Angus. Perfect. And for those of you who who are interested in that, I'll make sure that our team has those links in the show notes. So they're really easy for you guys to access and find. Okay, back to the Red Angus side of things. Mm -hmm. What is on the horizon, do you think, for the Red Angus breed as a whole? 
Well, a lot of things. I mean, we have been, we think, we need to quantify this a little further, but one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing major breed in the past 10 years. And that's kind of despite the color disadvantage that we have in the market, in the feeder cattle marketplace. So red is not as well accepted as black, and everybody knows that in the feeder cattle market. Now, we're working hard to bring some changes into that. But at the same time, we have done well in terms of growth and competitiveness. Uh, We would have been, I can't remember these numbers exactly, probably Jesse, but we were, it wasn't too much more than a decade ago. We would have had about 60,000, maybe 65,000 active cows in our inventory at Red Angus. So that means people have paid in a fee on those cows every year to keep them on the roster. And then they can register a calf at no additional cost and transfer an animal and so forth. Now we're a little over 100,000. So we have grown substantially. The strength of our breed really geographically would be the middle of the country, the middle third of the country. I always tell people with a northerly shift to it. Uh, Certainly Montana is very good for us and on into the northwest the Midwest, not as strong as we should be and I think will be in the future in the Southeast. There's a lot of cows down there. The red hide is an advantage down there because of heat and other places too. But, you know, another place we have huge opportunity is the state of California. That's an important cow state and we don't have as big a presence there really as we will in the future. So that we've done well. We've grown as a breed. I think we're, the association is in very good shape. Membership has grown substantially. We're very close to 5,000 members, which will be kind of a watermark. You know, when we get there, we're not too far from that. Our junior program is doing well. And the foundation of all of that actually is the Red Angus female. We call the Red Angus female the most favored female. And we do have data to support that uh, through Superior, through Superior Livestock. I mean, those whether it's open females or bred females, they will typically outsell any other breed. And so people understand that the red Angus female just makes a good cow. And for, she's a good stock cow, she's versatile, and you can actually breed her to about anything and come up with a marketable calf. So that's that's been a real stronghold of the growth we're talking about over the last, you know, 10, 12 years. As a red Angus herd owner, I firmly agree with all of that. I feel like they've got all of the best qualities. They're dog gentle to be around. They really are the best of the best in all of those genetic traits for sure. You know, the docility is a real plus. I mean, we do we do hear about that. I mean, convenience traits matter a lot. As you know, a lot of the ranching community is getting a little older, just like me. They got the same color hair I have for a lot of, in a lot of cases. And that means we want convenience, right? We want cows that you know, have good udders. You don't have to pair up calves and have problems that way. You want pulled cattle. You want docile cattle. You want fertile cattle that breed back. And so I think that has helped. I mean, because the Red Angus breed as a whole definitely delivers that. So Red Angus breed aside, we said this earlier, and I will say it again, what a time to be alive if you are in the cattle industry right now. What do you see for the future of the industry in the next three to five years? You know, there's a lot of things we could talk about there, Jesse, a lot of interesting things. We've talked about genetics, and I think the fact that genetics will play a bigger role in a number of different ways, that's just one to put a mark by and say this is going to happen. But I I think there's a lot of other interesting things, too. We We have always had difficulty in this industry attracting technology and investment in technology back to the ranch level. Maybe you'd argue that's happened in the feedlot side, and to some degree it has, certainly on the packing side, but never back to the ranch level. And that's something I'm seeing in spades. You're going to see a lot, and you are already. we're already seeing a lot of things tried in terms of technology and a lot of outside money coming in wanting to invest to support the use of technology in the cow-calf sector, but really all of the beef industry. Uh, Maybe a good example of that would be blockchain technology, which I have a very simple definition for blockchain technology that I think your your listeners will relate to. And that is we all understand a physical supply chain, right? Cattle are born on the ranch. You know, you buy a bull first. They're born on the ranch, commercial ranch. They go to a background or they go to a feedlot, ultimately to the packer and to the consumer. We're very segmented, of course, that there is a supply chain there. 
but it is very segmented in the way it operates. And I call it transactional. We're kind of transactional in the way that we do business with each other. So there is a physical supply chain, but as we evolve toward more coordinated supply chains and working together more, you know, not out of ownership or integration by ownership, I don't think that's going to happen, but by coordination and just sharing information. Well, you need, when you move that direction to these coordinated supply chains, we will need blockchain technology or we will find a lot of utility in blockchain technology because we'll need to share information and you can't really do all of that very conveniently or protect it if you just use spreadsheets. And so that is something that is coming. And I've never seen as much movement towards supply chains. A lot of them are small, of course, now, but there's a lot of movement that direction. And for a very simple reason, people find it better to work together than to just have these kind of surface relationships where we just transact a group of cattle and then we never talk to each other for another year. It's kind of like when I used to go into the quick shop and buy a candy bar and walk out. You know, that's a transactional relationship. We don't really know each other and we're just doing a little bit of business and then we forget about it. I guess until the next time you want a candy bar, right? But we're talking about, we're really talking about relationship building and creating more cooperation, more cooperative relationships between the segments. And that's just one example of a piece of technology and the blockchain technology that's coming that we'll probably use because it will help us do what we want to do. Oh, I like that because I think for a long time too, we've seen this in our industry where you're right, it is very transactional. So, well, why should I change what I'm doing on my ranch? Because it works for me, even if it doesn't benefit the person down the road, I'm not necessarily getting paid for it. So why should I change? But now I think when we work together more collectively and work through those cooperatives and just continue to share information and build those relationships, we do see the benefit of why we do where we are and how that benefits those around us or maybe negatively impacts those around us and why we should change because then we do have the opportunity to make that make more financial sense for us too. You know, absolutely. That's well said. And I think we need to adopt, and probably most of us have this mentality, but that we can do both things, that we can do what's good for us on the ranch and certainly protect our livelihood and do what we can in terms of the type of cattle we raise, the management inputs, health inputs, all of that that benefits us. We understand that the best at the ranch level for ourselves. But simultaneously, we've got one eye on the marketplace and one eye downstream, and we are looking for those opportunities that we can fit into our program on the ranch that will benefit the downstream rest of the industry and that so-called supply chain, but it will also, and that'll come back to us. I mean, I I think we're going to see some real interesting sharing of revenue that may go, you know, all from retailer all the way to back to the original producer. And if they produce a superior product that has extra value to the consumer, then I think we're going to see some payments come all the way back. And that's going to, that's going to change a lot in terms of the way we think relative to working together. I mean, simply working together. And we, we shouldn't forget also to, to uh, recognize the fact that once we have downstream data, and once that data is shared back to the ranch level, and even the segments in between, we're going to have the ability to create value in a way that we've never been able to touch in the past. I'll give you one simple example, Jesse. That would be health, okay? If, I, if I'm a rancher in Idaho, okay, where you live, and my cattle, maybe my health program isn't quite like it needs to be, and, and my cattle look good when they leave the ranch, but they consistently don't produce great results in terms of mortality and morbidity at the feedlot, okay? So if that's the case, I probably don't ever know that. You know, there's a good chance I never know that, and so I don't ever change. But if I had that information being fed back to me and I get that data and, you know, maybe I had twice the polls and twice the death loss that the industry average would be, then I'm going to take, if I'm a serious rancher, right, I'm going to take a good look at that and I'm going to say, what can I change with my health program to get better? Because I have pride in what I do and I'm not going to be worse than average for health. I want my calves to succeed for the next guy because He's going to, I want him to come back and bid maybe more next year. And so that's a simple example of how that downstream information can help us create more valuable animals that will benefit everyone. 
Oh, that might have been the mic drop moment of the day. I think we should probably end it there. Let's go over to the rapid fire round. What is the best piece of business or personal advice that you've ever been given? Yeah, I've been given a lot of good advice and uh, I, I remember quite a bit of it. I mean, the whole, we talked about this a little bit, but the don't give up, you know, stay at it. Uh, that's been very good. I think this is something that I kind of heard and I kind of learned that has meant a lot to me, Jesse. And I tell this to a lot of, we, we get the opportunity through our junior program and even otherwise to talk to a lot of kids in high school that are interested in agriculture or those in college, same thing. And what I have learned over the years is it's not about your first job. You know, you don't always get the first job that's just the job you always wanted. And maybe you don't even know as a younger person exactly the pathway forward in your career. But what I always tell people is don't worry about that. Okay, don't worry about that. Find a job where you can learn and build skills and put your whole heart into it. And what I learned in my career, because I I would confess, I mean, when I was in college and even in grad school, I did not have this nice plan pathway and some of the people around me did. And I remember thinking, boy, maybe I'm missing it here. I, I need to have a better idea of what I want to do. But I've learned two things over time in that. One, they probably didn't follow the plan they had laid out. And secondarily, if you just work hard at the job that you're in and you succeed in that job, people will see that happening and they will find you. And the next opportunity and the next and the next will open up to you. That's one of the most important things I think I can tell younger people is just don't worry about having a grand plan for your career. I know some people do and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think for a lot of us, let's find that first job where we can really learn. It's it's in a field where we want to learn, be a learner, and then work hard at it. And the next opportunity is going to come your way. Oh, I really like that advice. That's good stuff. Okay. If you could go to dinner with anybody dead or alive, who would you pick? I mean, in the industry, I don't know. I've had a chance to to go to dinner with a lot of people and uh, that's pretty hard to narrow down to one. I mean, I'm a Christian, so I would say Jesus Christ first, but he's still alive. So I get an opportunity to commune with him. So industry-wise, I think some of the brightest minds I've ever been around would be uh, People that come to mind would be like Tom Field. Uh, Tom Field is a fun guy. He's entrepreneurial, and I that's kind of how I'm bent, too. So I've always enjoyed spending a lot of time with Tom. He's done a lot for the business and a good friend of mine. What is one quote that you lead your life by? You know, work hard and uh, leave the results to the higher power. So that's, that's probably, uh, you can't always control results, but you do have those setbacks like we talked about and all kinds of things that you're doing. But the thing to focus on is, you know, you can't look back and you can't repeat yesterday. So, but what you can do is keep putting one foot in front of the other and you can, you can focus forward. That's always a good thing. And uh, let those results, I mean, the results will take care of themselves if you do that. Okay. Final question Is there a favorite book, podcast, program, service, something you think more people need to know about and you want to share it? You know, I'm a big reader and I'm currently reading the book Atomic Habits, which has been around for a while. You may have read it. It's very good. Uh, There's a lot of, I I read a lot of books. I don't know if I can narrow it down to one, but uh, I read a lot of marketing books just because I enjoy it. I I always tell people I'm about 25% salesman. I'm not a 100% salesman, but I like salespeople just because they are the front lines and they, you know, they are the ones that, like we talked earlier, they hear the word no a lot, but the good ones just take it with a grain of salt and let it roll off their back and they have tenacity. So I appreciate them. I like analytical people too. I mean, people that I'm kind of a numbers person. I'm I'm probably about a 50% a numbers person too. And and I like analytics and I like to make decisions from data. So those kind of books and things like that really, to me, you know, not everybody data speaks to them. I, my brother said this about me one time. He said, you know, data speaks to you. And I learned from that, but, but I am also a people person and I, I really do enjoy working with people. At this stage of my career, one of the things I have really enjoyed a lot is hiring young people, which we have done a lot of and watching them grow and helping them grow professionally. 
So there's uh, there's too many books out there probably to mention. I'm getting off of your question a bit, but that's a lot of fun is to, to see how much somebody can change. We've hired a lot of college graduates at Red Angus and, you know, since I've been around. And to watch the change, even just in the first year, to watch the growth as they get their professional feet under them is really fun. It's very enjoyable. And I do like that. Oh, well, I will. I'll take it back to Atomic Habits real quick. Guys, if you're listening and you have not yet read Atomic Habits, I don't know what you're waiting for because the last three podcast guests, I believe, have said this was the book that they recommend to people. So I don't know what what other additional sign you need at this point, but James Clear, Atomic Habits is a great book. You've got to read it. I will say that is something that you guys are known for is having a really strong company culture. We didn't ever talk about that in the episode, but you are obviously somebody who is responsible or partly responsible for developing that at Red Angus. What are your tips for creating a strong company culture? You know, one thing we try to do, Jesse, this is strategic and, you know, you can't control, you can't control everything about the people you hire and sometimes you misfire and we've sure done that. But we, one thing we consistently do is we do team interviews because we want to get input from, you know, more, more people rather than less, more minds are better than less. People see different things in a candidate that you're interviewing than one person might if it was me. I usually come in at the end, depending on you know who we're hiring, what department, and so forth. And uh, but we'd like to do team interviews. And one of the things I always have tried to train my staff on, and I think I hear them saying it now, so I think a lot of them are getting it. Is we look for people that are givers, not takers, and we also look for people that that are positive, not negative. And I learned the positive, not negative, from Randy Block at Cattlefax, first job I had out of grad school. Randy was. Randy was very good. He's a great people person. He, he taught me to look for people that just have a positive demeanor about life and they approach things with that. So we look for people that are positive, not negative, And we look for people that are givers by nature and not takers. And if you fill an office or you fill a staff with positive givers, a lot of good things will happen. And that's what we try to do. And I, that's a real simple rule. They have to have the skills, you know, they have to have the background and education and all that. But but uh, background and the education and sometimes some of the experience is easier to find than the positive giver part. And so that's what that's what we try to do. And I think it's it's again, I mean, it you fill a you fill a room with positive givers and great things are going to happen, really. And so that's one piece of the puzzle. I am fascinated just as a quick sidebar, Jesse how much this work from home thing is just taken over. And we have made some adjustments here because of it just in the last, even not that many months. And, you know, I'm, I'm the older guy that never really thought about that, but I've been thinking about it and introduced to it. And we've, we've made some changes and because that's the culture and we're making it work. And we always have had a fair number. We have 27 people on the Red Angus staff. And we have been over 50% remote for some time. Now, your field staff and everything, you understand that. But we're going to a hybrid office environment. We've already made that transition just because it is something that the younger generation really wants. And you find the right people, they will work anywhere. I, I do believe that. Oh, absolutely. And I will say, I think that it is important because not all jobs fit the remote lifestyle. But I will say, if a company is like an organization like you guys, where you're representing people across all states, across all of these different, you know, diverse operations, having a staff that is as diverse as that and is coming from those local areas versus being in one single office in one place, it's a lot easier to reach the people and to hear their problems and find those solutions and to have your office represent your members because they are just as diverse and, and as, you know, centrally located as the people that they're representing. And I think there's a lot of power in that for sure. There, there really is. And I think, you know, we're learning and I'm, again, I'm probably an old school guy that had to, had to take a little while to warm up to this, but I think we're seeing that, uh, people really, the younger crowd, especially, I mean, they, if you find the right ones, they, they want to work in an environment. They want some flexibility. And they want to work in an environment that is comfortable to them and they'll rise to the occasion. I, th I think, you know, we get things done and that's, of course, a very important part of all of it is we, 
know what the task is and we want to make sure we surround them with enough support, but they will go and get the task done. So our, our business, like most businesses, is a combination of teamwork and individual work. And you, again, you find the right people, they'll, they thrive in that environment and it can be something that they, you know, like the quieter time. There's less distraction from working from home part of the time, but they also enjoy the teamwork part of it. They're good communicators. That's a key, key part of it. You have to communicate and over communicate, but you find the people that can do that and they, they will do it successfully. Oh, I firmly wholeheartedly agree. What a way to end today's conversation. Tom, thank you so much for sitting down with us, for sharing all of your wisdom. I really appreciate it. I know our listeners do too. And as always, you guys, we will be back here next week. So stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you, Jesse. It's been a privilege. If you loved this episode, do us a favor and share it with someone else who might find just as much value in it as you did. We're on a mission to continue to grow and strengthen the future of agriculture and Western industries, and you spreading the word helps us make more of a positive impact. It also makes a big difference when you take a minute to go rate and review the show. We can't thank you enough for listening, for sharing, and for loving Ag and Western as much as we do. We'll see you back here for our next episode.